The scripture reading will come from John chapter 2. John chapter 2. Beginning in verse 23. It says there, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them, because he knew all people, and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. Well, good evening. Have you ever been asked that question? If you could have any superpower, what superpower would you have? Who picked flying? It'd always be neat to fly. Super strength? Super speed? What about reading minds? Wouldn't it be awesome to be a mind reader? To be able to look at somebody and know exactly what was going on behind their eyes? To know the thoughts? To know... That there are no lies, no secrets, no guessing, or reading between the lines. It'd be nice, but God didn't make us that way. We aren't mind readers. But tonight I want us to think a moment or two about what happens to our conduct when we start acting like we do know what's going on in other people's hearts. And I think it's really important to start with understanding that this is something that Jesus actually did. Jesus understood, as was read for us by Jason, what was in man. The statement from John chapter 2 is just a very blanket statement that Jesus knew what was in man. He understood the thoughts and intentions of the hearts of people around him. And we see this in numerous examples in the scriptures. In Matthew chapter 9 and verse 4, where he tells the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law are questioning in themselves, what in the world is he talking about? He can't forgive sins. That's, that's God's job. No man can do that. And it says there in verse 4 of Matthew 9 that Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, why do you say this? Why do you think evil in your hearts? What's easier to say? And he makes it clear that he has authority to forgive sins when he tells the man to get up and walk. The same idea comes up again in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 25 as he's healing people, casting out demons in that particular instance. And there the religious leaders are saying he's casting out demons by the prince of demons. And Jesus there makes it very clear that he understands their thought and starts addressing their questions without them actually verbalizing it. So those who criticize Jesus, he was aware. And the irony is they think they know what's going on in Jesus's heart. Who is this upstart? Who is this person who thinks he's God? And they have no idea. But they're assuming they know his intentions and his motives. They fancy themselves mind readers, when really the only man who's ever been able to read a mind is sitting right in front of them. We see this when Jesus interacts with other people, too. I think of the woman at the well in John chapter 4, the Samaritan woman. They're having this conversation about living water, and she finally says, Sir, give me this water so that I don't have to keep coming back here. And he says, go call your husband. I have no husband. That's right. You've been with five men, and the man you're with now is not your husband. What you have said is correct. And that woman then says, sir, I perceive you're a prophet. Jesus knew her story. She didn't have to tell him. She knew, he knew, what she had been through and what was going on in her heart. The rich young ruler in Mark chapter 10 and verse 21, coming up asking, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he goes through this laundry list. I've kept all these from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loves him and says, you lack one thing. And Jesus cuts to the quick of this young man's heart and knows what he's still struggling to let go of because Jesus knows what is in man. It's awesome to see and to think about just how Jesus knew the, the issues, the, the thoughts and the struggles that people were going with all around him all the time. And he showed grace and tenderness and compassion and correction when it was needed. Here's what I want us to understand tonight. Jesus knows people's hearts, but we don't. We're striving to be like Jesus. We are following in the footsteps of Jesus, but we will never be able to read the thoughts and intentions of hearts like he was able to, like he is able to. 
We are really good at jumping to conclusions. We are very good about assuming, and that can be very dangerous. There's a very basic principle that the scriptures actually talk about. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11, in the first section of that verse, Paul says, For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? Now, the context, he goes on to explain that this is the same with God's spirit, and the only, know, the only way we know the message from God is because God's spirit has revealed it to the apostles and, by extension, those who read their writings. But this is a principle that he's laid out very clearly. Who knows a person's thoughts except himself or herself? Everything else is an effort to try to get some understanding, whether it's through communication or just watching nonverbal behavior. You're the only person that's knowing what's going on in your head. Now, why do I bring all this up? Because it's dangerous when we assume otherwise. When we do think we are mind readers, we start supposing the motives of others. Do you remember David's brother Eliab in 1 Samuel 17? This is a verse we've talked about before on this subject. But in verse, 1 Samuel chapter 17, David comes down during the standoff with Goliath and the Philistines, with the army of Israel. And there's this conflict going on. David comes up with the supplies for his brothers. He hears Goliath's challenge. And he starts asking around, what, what's the deal with this Philistine? Why doesn't somebody go out and fight him? And he starts asking around, the king has promised this to those who will go out and fight this one. And then his oldest brother Eliab overhears this. This is where we pick up in verse 28. Now Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. David says, what have I done now? Was it not but a word? This older brother says, I know your heart, little brother. I know why you're here. You just want to be close to the action. You just want to see the excitement. How often do we do that? Whether it's we read something on Facebook, have an interaction with somebody, even somebody in the church building. We think, hmm, I know what they're thinking. Or we just assume the why behind actions that may have even been taken. It's really dangerous for us to be in Eliab's shoes, to say, I know this person's heart. We find out that very rarely do we actually know the full picture of the story. So we have to be careful that we think we know what's going on in somebody else's head without them telling us what's going on in their head and their heart. On the other side of this coin, though, is an equally important thing to consider. Because how often do you assume that other people know what you're thinking without you actually having told them? Because it's dangerous to suppose motives. It's also dangerous to have these unrealistic expectations that you should be a mind reader and you should know what I'm thinking. This can happen in marriages, with parents and kids, with employers and employees. God gave us the gift of communication for a reason. I think back here to Daniel chapter 2. Do you remember what Nebuchadnezzar, when he first has his dream, the request he makes of all of his in crowd, those, those dreamers and the soothsayers and all of these magicians that he had kind of on retainer? He says, I've had a dream and I want you to interpret it to me. And they say, okay, tell us the dream and we'll interpret it to you. And he says, no. No. <laughs> You tell me what I dreamed, and then you also tell me the interpretation, and then I'll know that it's real. Notice what these people say in verses 10 and 11 of Daniel chapter 2. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand. For no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The thing that the king asks is difficult. And no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. We read on and realize that the one God reveals this to Daniel because he knows what the king has dreamed and he can reveal it to his servant. But do we walk around like the king and say, these people should know what I'm going through. These people should know how I'm feeling today. These people should just know. And we think people are mind readers when we're not. It's so important for us to lean on one another, to share with one another, 
to be the family that we talked about in the songs that we sang and as Matt prayed for, that we are a family. That doesn't mean we just inherently know. We don't have ESP to just pick up when somebody's having a bad day. But we have the awesome gift of reaching out to one another, to leaning on one another, certainly to check in on one another. We've got to be very careful, though, that we are not putting an unrealistic expectation on other people to, so to speak, read our minds in those circumstances. Because in either of these cases, whatever side of the relationship we're on, the fallout is dangerous. We can take offense when there's none to be taken. We can assume the worst of a situation and make mountains out of molehills, if even that. We totally let our imaginations run wild with why somebody said the thing that they did or why they did that thing or why they looked at me a certain way. And I was about to sneeze, dude. I mean, <laughs> right? We're humans. But if we don't take the time to be real and honest and open with each other, and we just let our imaginations or our minds start running, we fancy ourselves to be mind readers when we are not. And of course, as I've mentioned and alluded to already, this is not just something we have to deal with people in the world. This can happen with brothers and sisters in the church if we are not mindful of it and address it when it comes up. Because this will lead to division even in the church. So we have to be careful of our motives and our expectations. And instead, to practice what Jesus will call in John chapter 7 and verse 24, righteous judgment or right judgment. Go ahead and turn there with me if you would. John chapter 7, just so we can read the verse in context and to see why Jesus even says this. Jesus knows we're not mind readers. We can't see into people's heads and what's going on and what the right thing to say is all the time. But in context in chapter 7, people are wondering, is this, is this the Christ? Could this be Jesus? And there's a whole lot of different reactions that you get here as you read through the chapter. Some are marveling at his power. Oh, it's amazing that he's doing all these signs. He's healed a man. Some are questioning, how did he learn this much? How is he so intelligent? How does he have so much wisdom at his disposal? And then you've got those, like we've already talked about with those religious leaders, very critical of his actions and questioning and looking for the ulterior motives. And so Jesus goes through here and very frankly says in verse 21 to summarize uh, what he says here, I did one work and you all marvel at it. Moses gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers, and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. You see, the Pharisees had gotten all wound up because he's healing on the Sabbath. He's doing work on the Sabbath. He's breaking God's law. And it's Jesus doing the will of God, doing God's work. And he makes it very clear. He says, if you do work by performing this act of the law, in the case here, circumcision, even on the Sabbath day, what are you going to tell to me when I'm doing God's work, when I'm healing a man miraculously by God's power and will? Don't judge by appearances, by what you think you know. Judge by righteous judgment. Take some time and actually think things through. And that's really the application that we move into in the final part of our lesson this evening. Just some practical things, how we can judge with right judgment. First and foremost, and I'm stepping on my own toes first of all with this, let me be clear. We've got to slow down. Husbands, wives, parents, children. Don't just assume the worst. We have got to slow down and think things through. Over in Proverbs chapter 25, I think there's some interesting application that could be made from the wisdom recorded here in Proverbs 25, verses 8, 9, and 10. Those verses say this, Proverbs 25, 8 through 10. Do not hastily bring into court, for what will you do in the end when your neighbor puts you to shame? Argue your case with your neighbor himself and do not reveal another secret, lest he who hears you bring shame upon you and your ill repute 
have no end. That's very beautiful wording to say, if you jump the gun and try to take somebody to court before you've actually figured out what the issue really is, you're going to be in a whole lot of hurt. Financially, your reputation, your relationships. And so you sit here and say, well, Tyler, I'm not taking anybody to court. I hope not. I hope you don't ever have to. But how often do we take people to court in our minds? I'm in the right. This person's offended me. That may be true, but how often is that just us jumping three steps ahead when we haven't actually talked to them to actually address, as it says here in verse 9, to directly confront or talk about this with the neighbor in question? Is that we just go straight off to, let's take this to court. Let's do something about it. The wisdom of the scripture says, slow down and think for a little bit. And that leads directly into this next point of being direct, being frank. Did you know that there was a frank in the Bible? I'm about to show you. Leviticus chapter 19, 17, and 18. To be clear, this is not the name frank. But depending on your translations, you will see the word frank here. Leviticus chapter 19, 17, and 18. And by the way, if somebody uh, is ever questioning whether the God of the Old Covenant and the New Covenant are the same God, the God of the Old Testament and the New Testament, here is where a foundational teaching that Jesus carries over into the New Covenant starts. This is where God talks about the importance of love and loving our neighbors. Leviticus 19, 17 through 18, though, he's got some pointed direction here. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Notice here how the law, even in the Old Testament, makes it very clear that the motive is love, but that it demands of us some certain behavior. And it says, be direct, be frank with the other person. We are way too quick to go and gossip and talk about somebody behind their back rather than talking to them directly about it. That's how God's people conduct themselves. Even in the cases of sin, like Leviticus is talking about here, Jesus in Matthew 18 will say, if your brother sins against you, go to him directly. That's the first step. Be direct. If you don't know, just ask. Instead of trying to guess, read their mind, all you got to do is ask. Are the conversations uncomfortable sometimes? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're humans, right? That's going to be uncomfortable. It's a lot less uncomfortable than you jumping the gun, me jumping the gun, and thinking, I know what they're thinking, what they're doing, and find out that I am so wrong down the line. And what it does is it opens our hearts to think the best about people first to really take in and learn about another person before we assume the worst. This is what it looks like to practice the love that 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is talking about. When Paul writes the Corinthians here, in 1 Corinthians 13, he shows them the way of love and the demeanor and the characteristics, how love conducts itself, how we are to live if we're going to be walking in the way of love that Jesus paved for us to walk in. But in verse 7, we have some practical application for this topic. When he simply says, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Our common phrasing might be giving the benefit of the doubt. Thinking about the other person first before I think how it's upset me or offended me or made me feel. Those are all valid and important to think about. But we need to put others first. Our walk with the Lord teaches us to do no less. Quite frankly, the most practical application in all of this is how we speak. That we are giving the benefit of the doubt. And we're pursuing the best outcome, no matter who we might be talking to. And then finally, even in those difficult situations that you might be thinking of, yeah, but it's okay. Okay. You're still not a mind reader. God knows what's going on, first of all, in your heart, and that's where we have to focus the changing in my heart. And he knows what's going on in the heart of the other person. 
So my last piece of advice from Scripture here is let the Lord bring that to light. It's not your job to dig it up. God is the one who understands and knows these things. And Paul, if you flip a few pages back in 1 Corinthians, this time to chapter 4, he says this at the beginning of this chapter, beginning in verse 1. This is how one should regard us, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself. For I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. God knows what you go through. He knows the struggles that you face, the temptations you fight, the difficult relationships you have to navigate. He knows what's going on in your heart, and he knows what's going on in those other people's heart. Trust him, and that his way is the best way to conduct yourself in your speech and your actions in such a way that shows everyone that you might meet the love of Christ, the truth of the gospel, that we would be judges with proper judgment, not judging out of hypocrisy or by our own standards, but that we would seek to let the Lord handle the rest. He knows hearts, and he will judge. And this really brings us full circle back to Jesus, doesn't it? Jesus, when he was here, knew the hearts of men. He had conversations with people before they even brought things up that were on their heart. And I love this line from that woman back in John 4 the Samaritan woman at the well, do you remember what she goes and she tells people after her conversation with Jesus and she realizes that he's the Messiah? She runs to people in that town and she says, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? I have to imagine that it is unnerving to have a conversation with somebody who can truly read your mind. And I think if we were to put ourselves in that perspective of sitting across the table from somebody, we would feel very uncomfortable and vulnerable in a bad way. Because people, they might hurt us. They might expose these things when we don't want them to. They, they might judge us. They might push us away. What I love about Jesus in every instance of him being able to see and interpret the thoughts of people's hearts is he uses it to bless. Sometimes it's for correction, which is what those people need in that time. But you think about this woman and the baggage she carried and the heartache she was in. And Jesus knew her heart. And he tells her that he does. And he says, I want you still can't read your mind tonight. I don't know what's going on with you, but your heavenly father does. Your savior does. And he knows what burdens you carry. He knows the dreams and the hopes and the aspirations. And when Christ looks into your heart, he's doing it to expose the thoughts and intentions of our heart so that we could be free, free from sin, free from our mistakes. And brought back into the family of God. God knows it all. Our best for whatever that's worth. And he certainly knows our worst. And he wants us and he loves us just the same. It's awesome to see when a soul understands this. And they choose to accept this awesome grace and love. We saw it this last week with Nessa. Choosing to obey the gospel. We saw it again this afternoon with Arthur White he decided to put on Christ in baptism. Two souls that have found the beauty of being known by God and putting their whole heart and trust in him. And I do wonder if there's anyone else here tonight that needs to make that same choice that these two young people have recently made. To open their hearts to the Lord. To commit to him. To obey the gospel and to be washed clean of their sin to be part of the family of God 
the way that you were made to be. And I know that even if you're here tonight and you've done that, that we struggle in our relationships, there are difficulties, and there are things that we go through each and every day. Never forget that your Savior knows your heart. He holds it in His hand, and He wants to build it up, not crush it. And He's put us in this family to help one another, not to try to guess what's going on with each other's lives, but to lean on one another as we all lean on Him. So if you need to do that tonight, if you need to ask for prayers, if you have questions you need to ask, or if you are ready to obey the gospel, please let us know. Don't leave here without any of those things being unresolved. And if it's right now, don't wait. You can come forward while we're standing and singing this song.